Don't you just want to, like, yell out hallelujah every once in a while? Do you ever want to do that? You guys want to join me? You guys want to join me? Just, like, I want to, one, two, three, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want to keep saying it, man. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo! Hallelujah. If you, if you can and if you're willing, please rise for the reading of the word this morning. First Thessalonians 4, verse 1 through 12. Finally, brethren, we urge you and exhort you. Exhort you. We don't want to extort anybody here. <laughs> Let me start over. Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord, Jesus, that you would abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God for your Holy Spirit and for your presence here today. We ask your blessing and hand to be upon our pastor as he teaches us and admonishes us and strengthens us and comforts us and encourages us this morning. We ask all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Gerald. Uh, just a couple really quick announcements. Um, Debbie Arcan lost her sister this week. And um, keep Debbie... Lift it up in prayer as you think about her this week. Uh, it's a tough thing, as we all know, who have experienced loss. But this woman is a pretty amazing woman. She is on a track for getting fired up about the things of God. Like, it's exciting, isn't it, Jane? It is. So keep her lifted up in prayer that this would only cause her to grow and flourish and not fear and set back. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Oh, I have them. I was going to say I really missed you all these last couple weeks, but that would just not be the truth. I did miss you. I did. But, you know, uh, I got a chance to spend some time with family, and uh, we had a wonderful time. I was on a fishing boat with a couple of redheads that were catching fish like crazy. I had a couple others of my grandkids that were out on the boat. They don't have red hair. They got black hair. Not that it matters, but they were a joy to be with. And we were slaying the fish. And we had a fish feast that was to be envied. And then I tell this to Bruce, and he says, Oh, I got a fish story for you, basically, is what he said. And I just... <laughs> so, but it was a great vacation, a great time away. And I got a chance to hear Pastor Tim's message, which was perfect. It was just Perfect. And then I heard feedback from Mike Waldrop, who spoke the next week. I haven't seen his yet, but that too, from what I hear, was really something. So um, this church is growing, man. We're in good hands with what God is doing in the people of this church. Thank you for that. Is this mine? All right. Plea for Purity is the title of the message. And this is a challenging message, and you heard me allude to that when I was, when I was speaking to the, the men in the church, the fathers in this church. But when we're talking about the book of Thessalonians, and 1 Thessalonians especially, we know three things. We know that trials will come. The early part of the book talks about that. We know temptations will come, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And we know that Jesus will come, and we will hit that next week. 
And if there was a day you wanted to invite somebody to this church just to rock them, next week is the week to do it. Next week explains things that most people don't know. And it clarifies things that they think they know, but they really don't. But it brings the truth of God's word in a way that it'll challenge us all. But this is a place to bring somebody that you've been having a hankering to invite for quite some time. So we're in the first Thessalonians, Thessalonica. It's in Greece. It's, it's located in the Grecian area. It's across the Aegean Sea from Turkey. That's the location of this. And that's Thessala- Thessalonica is the old name, Salonica. I can't even speak the name. But that name is what's current today, Salonica. What, how do you pronounce it? Oh, my goodness. My one, my one hope left me. And there's about two to three hundred, uh, two to three um, million people in this region, in the world today. I'm laying this foundation for you because this is this Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. These are the places where the foundation of our faith began to take root and take off. This is all part of Paul's missionary journey. And if you want to read more about that journey, you go to Acts chapter 17, and it'll explain it in more detail about what was happening during this time. But this was a challenge to the men of these communities in a, in a way that uh, men today, I don't know, outside of what's in this church, can handle very well. You see, we're in a competition with the world. I hate to put it like that, but that's really what it is. Competing for the souls and the hearts of men. One leads to everlasting life and joy, and the other leads to decline and destruction. If you have eyes to see, you can look and and gaze upon the world today, and you know that there are people dying and going to hell because they're so lost. Their thinking is so polluted by a culture that is out there deceiving, 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 and I'm not here to rip on a culture. I'm here to rip on the spirit behind that culture. It's demonic. It's off. It's godless. That's what they were facing in that day, and that is what we face in this day. Deception has its, its, its hands, its roots, its feet, its being in the world today. And the time is short, and we'll hear more about that next week. Oh, but for us believers, praise God. So, 2 Thessalonians is as much about the return of Christ. That's what's next week. All right? The expectancy of the second coming of Christ was real to the Thessalonian people. I'm not so sure how real it is for the people of today. And I'm speaking, now I'm going to speak to the church for a second. I don't know that the church knows how real it is today about Christ's second coming. We've been deluded through culture. We've been deluded through school systems. We've been deluded through media. We've been deluded through social media. We've been deluded because we take it in, we take it in, and we take it in. We don't push it out or fill, it, fill ourselves up with enough of what the truth of God's word is. That's very honest. I know I'm not making a whole lot of friends right here, but maybe we'll make a convert or two. We're deceived by a culture. And we are on a fast track. This is, this is how I see it. And by the way, from the time of Paul to the time of now to the time of Jesus after he left to the time of now, every believer thought that the second coming of Christ was going to happen in their generation. And you know what? That's okay. It's meant to be that way. We're to have our eyes fixed upon heaven. But I'm telling you, when I look at the world today, I'm saying, why no, we're much closer than we've ever been to the return of Christ. But I'm saying, pieces are in place. Prophecies have been fulfilled with one remaining prophecy, and the remaining prophecy is the return of Christ. And we'll hear about that more clear next week. Hopefully, we'll have some music to go along with that statement. So I want you to be aware that what we're teaching you is for your glory. So God is in 1 Thessalonians, he's preparing, in this case, the hearts of the people to be right before him. 
Because the reality is we don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return. We're to be ready. Hopefully ready. Looking for the blessed hope, it says in Titus, the blessed hope to return. We're to be ready for it. And the first question I have to ask myself is, am I ready? Some days I am, some days I'm not. I hope he picks it on a good day. But the reality is it doesn't even matter because I am in him. I know Christ. Have I made mistakes? All kinds of them. Michael, I love your boldness to come up and say what you shared. Yes, your honesty. No, 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 no. No, I loved your boldness that you came up. He's going to come up here and preach. I know him. (laughs) But the boldness to say what you did is beautiful, and yet here you stand worshiping God because you know you're forgiven. You know you're saved. You know what your future holds, right? And it's the same for every believer in this room. All right, but we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about what that means. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 says, Finally then, brethren, we urge you and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, that you abound. What does that mean? Well, Philippians 4.8 gives us a really good picture of abounding, and you can find it in all kinds of other places in the Scripture, but it sounds something like this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, whatever thing is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, these things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. This is Paul speaking. A human being. This isn't even Jesus speaking. He's speaking words that Jesus gave him to speak, but he's speaking even the things that you saw in a man, a regular man, an anointed man. These things do, and the God of peace will be with you. So when in this first verse of 1 Thessalonians 4 says that we are to think on these things, this is what you're to be thinking on. This is what you're to be believing on. This is what you're to abound in more and more and more. And verse 2 says, For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you all know the commandments? I know about three of them. I know six. Well, this guy says, I know all ten. Well, that's the one you ask if he's living by them. The the ten commandments. The Bible says that Jesus came to fulfill all things, and he fulfilled the Old Testament law. Does that mean we don't need to know the Ten Commandments, which comes out of Exodus, which is the Old Testament? No. We need to know the Ten Commandments. We need to know what Scripture says about the Ten Commandments because it speaks to the heart of God, and it's a picture to us where we're on or where we're off. Know the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm a New Testament believer. You're a knucklehead if you don't think you need the Old Testament. You're not the believer you think you are. You're looking for grace, 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 but you don't want to really embrace truth, truth, truth and the fullness of it. You should know the Ten Commandments. Don't ask me to quiz them. I get eight out of ten like that. I just know it. No, I get ten. Give me a little time. I'll get all ten. You should know the commandments. We should know what happened in the Old Testament because it, it, it brings to life the New Testament and the New Covenant. And now when it says that the law and the prophet hang on these two things, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, you get a better understanding what that actually means. Right? If I know the Old Testament, I know what God is saying here. And many times it's a little bit deeper than we think it is. And we'll talk about love just in a little bit here. And then it says in verse 3, and this is the one that's going to rock us a little bit, It says in verse 3a, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What is the will of God for your life? Many of us have asked that question. Is it to run over signs in front of the fleet farm? Is that the will of my life? You know, is it to become an expert at this thing or that thing or this thing? No. The will of God for your life is your sanctification. What is sanctification? That's right. It is becoming holy. How do you become holy? 
First, you become holy by filling yourself with God. That's how we become holy. We fill ourselves with Christ. Then what do we do? Is that enough? It's a lot. I mean, we are saved by grace through our faith in who? In Jesus. Not of the works we do, lest any man should boast. So it's enough. But is it real? Ah, yeah, I'll take a couple of Jesus salvation cards. I'll take, uh, put them in my pocket, in my billfold. In case I get in a car accident, they'll know I was saved. You know, I mean, it's just, we can get ridiculous. But the, the truth is, know what salvation is up against the Old Testament Ten Commandments. Now know what salvation is. What is it? The Ten Commandments told us we couldn't do it by herself, that we needed a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. He steps in, and he pays the price that we should pay. And now all of a sudden, when I, when I talk about my sanctification and becoming holy, what does that mean? It means I am called to be like him. Do I fall short? Of course I do but my track is to become more and more like Christ every day, that I would abound in the good things that we just read. Are you with me? Okay, just just making sure. This is heavy stuff. The action or declaring or the making of one to be holy. Why is holy such a big word? Well, in Leviticus 11.44, it says this. I'm going to read this to you because I just I love. Where's Leviticus? Leviticus is in the Old Testament. So what am I doing? I'm taking a New Testament statement and call on our life, and I'm going to bring it right back to the Old Testament. And that's what I was asking you to do earlier. He says, For I am the Lord, your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping things or creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Well, he took care of the creeping things that go along the earth and all that was very Old Testament. But the call to be holy is still true today. What does it mean to be holy? It is to be like God. Not like God in equality. We strive to be like Christ. Love like Christ. Well, how did Christ love? He told us the truth. What did he tell us? You're a sinner. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. And apart from me, you can do no good thing. And in me, you have eternal life. You have salvation. And then he says, be holy. This is what he's calling us to do. Be holy. Be like Christ. We fall short, but we press on to be like him. Do you know in your heart of hearts when you're not being Christ-like? Raise your hand if you know in your heart when you're not Christ-like. Okay, we're pretty much on the same page here. I know when I'm messing up. And if I don't know when I'm messing up, there's people in my life who'll tell me I'm messing up. And that's a gift from God too. Sometimes it's just a, a quickening in my spirit and sometimes it's a... It's a brother or sister speaking life to me. And I've had it happen. Thank you. Our sanctification's a big deal. We're to grow to become like Christ. That's the bottom line. Why is it such a big deal to be holy? Well, Paul tells us that God's will for our lives is our sanctification, our growth in holiness. But his primary concern is that we be holy because it directly opposes the non-believer's worldview. Oh, here's the fight. Our call to be holy goes against the worldview that's in existence today. Most people know the worldview because you've lived in it your whole life. The believer knows that the worldview is nonsense to the things of God. The worldview gets you nowhere eternally. Okay, A biblical worldview is a little different. That's God's view of what you are called to be and what you are called to do and who you do it through and by which power you do it. You do it through Christ by the power of his spirit. It's how you live the biblical ways that he's called us to live and it establishes a worldview in you that lines up with his view. I don't know, that's kind of, a, I babbled that one through a little bit. I hope you got it. And then 3B says, you should abstain. Here's where it hits us. 
you should abstain from sexual immorality. We're talking about worldview. We're talking about Old Testament. We're talking about New Testament, creeping things in the Old Testament. And, and Jesus Christ in the New Testament, why does it have to bring sex into the picture? Sex is a real picture of our flesh. And it speaks to one of the greatest struggles we have in the world today. If you look at the media and all those things that we talked about before, it is inundated with this. Nothing defiles us like the, 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 the worldview of sex. Everything's changing, and it's changing at break, breakneck speed now. And you have to know the truth of it. Otherwise, you get caught up in the current of this world, which takes you to no good place. Don't fall for the lies of the enemy concerning sex and sexual issues. Sex is a gift from God, and it's meant to be used as he saw fit between a husband and a wife is what sex was created for, for the purpose of repopulation, for the purpose of being a picture of Christ and his relationship with the church, for the purpose of a husband and wife being so knit together that my body and my life are not my own, they're my wife's. I just heard that yesterday, and I said, I got to use that. And her life is not her own. It's mine, and together, it's for that relationship. Why is that such a big deal? Because it brings about an intimacy between a couple that was meant to be. And if that's not in place, we give up and we quit too easy. It's too easy to give up. Sometimes it just takes a hurt. Sometimes the hurt comes because of a word spoken in anger against me. That's it, I'm out of this marriage, I'm gone. You can't treat me like that. I'm the head of the house, for goodness sakes. No, that's not how, that's not how it's supposed to work. Because God, when he talks about abounding and superabounding, he'll take us to the place of forgiveness. So what do I have to do now? I gotta forgive my wife when she says a word. And really, that doesn't happen too much in our house. It's more like... She has to forgive me for things I've said or things I've done or secrets I've kept. You guys get the, you get the point, kind of? Okay. We are called to abstain from sexual immorality. It, it comes from the place called, uh, there's a word in the Greek called pornea, which is pornography. Any sexual activity outside of the bounds of marriage is sexual sin. It violates the institution of what God has designed. Well, I'm not married to anybody, so I'm not hurting anybody. Well, what you're doing is you're doing self-destruction. You're, you, you're messing with your own head as to what love is and what it isn't. You don't know because you're just, you, you, you're, you, it throws you off. You don't know the truth. Sexual sin violates the institution that God has designed. Now, in all this stuff that I'm sharing concerning this, there is forgiveness in Christ. And when Christ forgives us for our past, our present, and for the sins we're going to commit in the future because we're in our, of our humanity, his forgiveness is complete, and it is done if you are in him. If you are not in him, you carry that yourself. You take that at the white throne judgment. You say, yeah, this is what I did, but I heard about that Jesus. Well, good for you for hearing about that Jesus, but you didn't accept him. You didn't say that he was your savior from this moment. You didn't, you didn't receive the forgiveness that he offers by asking for it. Forgiveness as big as we talked about a few weeks ago in God's economy. Well, how serious is this sex sin? It gets very serious, and it's very subtle, but it's very uh, demeaning. It's very dangerous. Matthew 5.28 says, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's a pretty subtle way to commit a sin, is a glance. And maybe it's not the glance. Maybe it's a second glance. But it is a sin. Why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's a sin. James 1.14 says this, and I want everybody to hear this. This is, this is big for me. 
But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. A look can lead to lust. Lust can lead to an action. An action can lead to, you get it from there, right? Devastation. Devastation of what? Of each person, of another marriage possibly, and it doesn't satisfy. It never satisfies. Sin is so temporary in terms of its satisfaction, but it is so eternal in terms of its consequences. All right? What do we do if we've sinned? You come to Christ. You give it to him. What does he do with it? Is he shocked by your sin? Not at all. Not at all. He cannot wait to forgive you. In fact, everything about these next two weeks is going to be about his desire to forgive us and to make us whole and to wipe our slate clean from sin. And then we struggle because we just, oh, I, I did it again. When I come to him again and ask for forgiveness, he takes it again. Remember the message on 7 times 70, which is an eternal time for forgiving? And that's what's, that's what's happening here. But this is the power of sin in our, against us when we don't have somebody to take care of it. And then there's an example with, um, in 2 Samuel 11, 2. And it says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. All right? He saw it. My hunch is, based on having an idea what Scripture is trying to communicate to us, he didn't just catch a glance. He was gazing upon. So much so that he did this. He said, so David sent and inquired about the woman. He's done right there. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Yes, it was. So what were the consequences of David looking, taking a second look, processing, pondering, and then calling for? Well, I'm not going to read all the, the whole story, but basically it looks like this. The particular adventure of looking led David to lusting, then to adultery, then a pregnancy, then a murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, who was a good godly man, and then finally, death of the baby. One sin grew and blossomed. So when I was joking the other day, look, don't take the second look. Oh, I took a second look. Don't take a third look. That joke is a real thing in terms of what happens when we begin to entertain sin. Now, right now, we can all handle this message because nobody knows. What are you watching on TV? What movies are you watching? What music are you listening to that put this in your face every day? That you ponder it, you process it, you envelop it. And now you're going to make a wise decision? And then my question is, are we putting God's word in us as much as we're putting the world in us? And I know these sound like cliches, but there's, there's something to this. We're to abound differently in a different direction. Apart from God, we abound differently. Then there's another story of, of uh, David and Goliath. Now, this is the same David, but now this is when he was younger, and he's fighting the Philistine. All right? I'm going to tell you that story another time because I'm giving you the wrong one. I am so sorry. It's not about David. It's about Samson. I thought of Goliath, and I thought of Samson. I thought, no, this is about Samson, who goes to his parents and says, I want this Philistine woman. I want you to get her for my, to be my wife. Well, to take this woman would be to take on her and her culture, and the Jews didn't permit that. The Israelites didn't permit it. He couldn't do it. And he pressed the issue. And what happened? It led to destruction, didn't it? It all led to destruction. He gets the woman, she betrays him, and there's all kinds of evil happening all the time because that's the culture she came from. She was easily bought, 
and paid for, and he had it all coming because he refused to do what God had called him to do. A look is what enticed him away from his faith. A look enticed another man to do things that were derogatory, that were evil, that were wicked to another woman and their family. So what's the big deal about it all? What's the, what's the whole thing? God is holy and cannot be a part of sin. This is getting to the foundation of the issue of sin. Our God is holy. There is none like him. And he cannot be a part of sin. So much so that, and you hear this scripture from us all the time, that he who knew no sin became sin. That's Jesus. He became who sin? He became our sin. For what purpose? To take the punishment that you and I deserved. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what a loving God does. He made a way. He's not the God that takes every fun thing away from us, every enjoyable thing, every vice that we want to do. No, he wants to protect us. He wants to save us for the greater things. And then when he was on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God. Actually, he didn't say it like that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the Bible tells us that the father turned his head when he gazed upon his son on the cross who became the sin of the world. Sin is detestable to God. And if for no other reason, that's why we avoid it. And if for no other reason, that's why we confess it. And if for no other reason, that's why we lay it at the feet of Christ because he takes it willingly that we don't have to pay for it. This is all out of 1 Thessalonians. Probably won't come here next week after hearing all these heavy things. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the scripture I was giving you. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That Verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians says that each of you should know how to process or possess, I'm sorry, his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That's what he's calling us to do. Sanctification, if you think of something being sanctified, you're thinking of something being cleaned, that's what's happening. We're being cleaned and we're being made holy and that's what he's calling us to. The church, here's what happens. In this day that we live, when we become holy, we become obvious. When you walk and live a holy life, you become obvious to the world. They see it. They don't always receive it, but they see it and they know it. Why is that such a big deal? Because God's given us a call. He said that we are to, just like he did the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell the truth. The reason why I got excited is because I had a man come up here and tell the truth. What excites God? The truth. Why? Because he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. Truth is a big deal. And that's what God is bringing us to this point. And it's something that's exciting. And it's for all of us who receive the fullness of it. Thank you, Jesus. That's the big why. That we don't pollute and violate our sanctification, our vessel. Don't you know? Don't you know that my vessel, your vessel, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us? Do you ever hear the see the Spirit filled people, the believers? When you come to Christ and you say, I want Jesus to come to me, what you're saying is this vessel that I controlled, that I ruled, is now his vessel for him to control, him to rule. And for him to dwell, he dwells in us by by his spirit. Isn't that beautiful? That we're a vessel. Why would you go pollute and taint the vessel that you've created for God in your heart, for Jesus? We have my brother and sister-in-law come and stay at our house. Do you know what we do? (laughs) We get the place cleaned up. That's my brother-in-law. Why do I got to clean up for my brother-in-law? I don't want to clean up for him. He'll be, he's a tough guy. He can handle it. The guy's six foot eight. None of our beds fit him. His toes end up at the other side of the, he'll be fine. He's lived a tough life. He can handle it. My sister's four foot nothing like me. 
She'll be all right. But why do we clean it up? Because we make it about us and our image. Why do we clean up for God? Because we make it about him. And we honor him and we know that this is a dwelling place where he lives in us. So my sanctification is about making a residence for God to dwell. Why do I want God to dwell in me? Because when he wants to use me, he is there. You understand what I'm saying? He is here. And things are quickened in my spirit. Things are quickened in my mind. Things are quickened that I know what he's calling me to do. It's a short phone call from the temple to the, my brain. And I'm taking some liberties with some of those statements, but I think, you know, but 2 Corinthians 6, 19 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Remember what I said about the husband and wife? Sally, she's me. And me, I'm, I'm hers to do with, right? Hear this. You are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's the call. We're to glorify him in our bodies, not defile it. When you defile your body, you're not defiling against man or yourself so much as you are defiling against God. And when I get those understandings in my head, it helps me to move forward. I see it. I get it. If you don't see it and get it, ask them to reveal it to you. Ask them. These are hard statements. I'm not talking about your past. I'm talking about the next micro moments in front of you. Verse 5 says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 5 says, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. We're to be different. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, who is called out of darkness into his light, that's who we are as believers. We don't go back to the stench of the pig pen. No, we go to the the glorious gates of heaven. I mean, that's where we're going. And when we walk, we walk as though he is in us and with us. To what end? To his end. For his purposes, that he would be glorified, that the lost would be saved. Why? Because they're going to know. They're going to see it in you. And you're going to have an impact on people that we're called to have. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to skip ahead here. There's so much. In Galatians 4.8 it says, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. All right? And that's what happens. Before we knew God, we served everything that was not of God. And it's subtle. You won't, you can't, You can't get it just by those statements so much as when you see it and it's recognized and it's revealed to you, you're going to be like, oh, it'll gag you because you'll see the reality of what our life is apart from God. It's revealed to you. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What's the other consequence? God is a holy God. And I said before, he can't, hey, face the front. All right. He's a holy God. He can't be a part of sin. He can't be around sin. But the other consequence is he is a wrathful God against sin. And he is going to deal with sin in the end. And people see the wrathful God and they want no part of it. But you can't understand the full love of God until you see the wrathful God against sin and what it does to his people. So God will demonstrate wrath against sin. And you know where he poured that wrath? It was on his son. The wrath of God was poured onto the son when when he became our sin. He carried our sin. That's what's in God's heart concerning sin. His heart concerning us is that he loved us so desperately that he put it on his son that we wouldn't have to carry it if you are his. If you're not his, you're carrying your own sin to the white throne judgment to a wrathful God. And you'll see the wrath of God at that time. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I got to go a little faster here. My goodness, it's pretty near lunchtime. Verse 6 says that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we are also forewarned, 
uh, you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but he called us to holiness. So the challenge of this church is, yes, you have to become a believer first, but then you have to come to holiness. Be holy, for I am holy, is what he says. And that's where he's bringing us. Why is this such a big deal today? Because everything in this world today is drawing you away from holiness. Everything in this world is drawing us away. And he's trying to pull us too. Holiness, be holy. Be holy. Be holy. First Peter quotes Leviticus and it says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all you do. For it is written, because I am holy, for I am holy, be holy. It's so beautiful. First Thessalonians 4, 8. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects God. And we said that before. Next reason is for love. Love. Verse 9 says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. This is, this is so simple, isn't it? Just to love. Love, 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 love. Love, love, love. I am telling you, love is no easy thing when we do it like God has called us to do it. You'll hear love happening in these last days that we live, and it's going to be like a blanket thrown over us. Love, love. Everything is acceptable. We take you just as you are. Those are lies from the pit of hell. I'm telling you, be on your alert. That is not the love of God. The love of God challenges us to be more than what we are. The love of God loves us and tells us to forgive those who have hurt us. The love of God died for us. This love that's going out in the world today is, is a counterfeit. It's an accepting love. Oh, you, you're into this? Well, that's good for you. Come and join us. Oh, you do those things? That, that's okay. We're okay. Everybody is welcome. Doesn't that sound beautiful? That's not truth. If you're not telling people the truth of what you know, you're lying to them. Lying is not love. That's what the enemy does to us. He lies to us daily, constantly. When he calls you to love, he calls you to be truthful. That doesn't mean you be harsh. You tell them the truth. What is it that the church is not doing? We're not telling the people we love the truth. Why? Because we're selfish. What does that mean? That means I don't want to tell them the truth because they're going to laugh at me. They're going to mock me. They're not going to want to hang around me. So I don't tell them. That's selfishness. That's not love. Love is, I am telling you the truth. I am going to go to the cross and die for you that you can be eternally with me. That's love. And that's what people need to hear. Not the nonsense that's peddled today. And I, 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 I have so many examples in my head, I can't think of one. Of what this deceptive love is. And you hear me mock songs of the 1960s, the age of Aquarius, when all these songs came out. They're all best commercials I ever saw. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. Are you kidding me? As soon as everybody is waddling in perfect har harmony from the world's perspective, some nation's going to come and blow them out of the water. No, perfect harmony is within the body of Christ. The body of Christ, we, we, we come together in that truth. And we understand that truth. And that kind of love says your, your life is to be sacrificial. Your life is to be about others more than yourself. Oh, the more than yourself part. That's not what's in the other love. That's what's in God's love. Sacrifice of self. I got people in Celebrate Recovery that are pouring into other people's lives not just on Thursday nights, but in step studies and in small groups. And they're pouring in. What are they pouring in? They're pouring their life into them. To what end? That they would hear the truth. They would, they would speak in love that where you're going is death. It's killing you. What this, what, what this has with Christ is life. And it's better for you. Therese, that's what you're doing when you step into that, that place. And every other person engaged. It's, it's a love that's filled with the truth of God. If you're not sharing God, who is the truth? 
you're not fully, you're not fully communicating all that he is. And then the question is, why aren't you sharing? Because you're going to get laughed at? That was my big reason for a long time. Look for sneaky ways to tell him about Jesus. It's going to ambush him with it. And I know I need to become a billboard more than I am now to tell them who he is. Okay, I pretty much got most of you to sleep, so we'll get you back up here in a second here. Verse 10. And indeed, let's see. Oh, here's what happens. It says in Galatians 4.16. I just, I came across this and I loved it. It says, I have therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. That's, what, that's why we don't tell it. Because the people we tell, we're going to become enemies. Well, the reality is, if they're apart from Christ and you're in Christ, there's a division and a separation already. You tell them so they can be with you. You have to tell them with the same heart that God revealed himself to you. And it's a love revelation. This is, this is love. The Bible says that God is love. It says that God is truth. And it's interesting in, in this day that those two ingredients are missing in the world's love. The world's love is something else. It's about tolerance. It's about acceptance. It's about everybody is welcome. Everybody can walk through the doors, but they're going to hear the truth. And we have to tell them the truth. And it's hard. Because sometimes it's not received. It's okay if it's not received. That's between them and God. Our job is to tell. That's the challenge to the church is to go tell. We tell. That's a win. I think we should have a party every, every month. We should have a party, a potluck. You all bring the food potluck for the people that shared Christ with somebody and said he loves you he died for you he wants you to be his he wants you from the world and if they thumb their nose at you or if they blow you off or if they laugh at you that's why we have the potluck to celebrate that victory and then we can look up to God and say God I, I told him like you told me to I give him to you I give him to you God we don't hate them. We don't get angry at them. We give them to God and let God do what God does. Amen? If the worship team could come up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Here's how, here's how it's simple, but it's deep with God when we want to get right before him. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's all of us in here. We have sin. That's just, as human beings, we, we sin. And the truth is not in us. So if we deny our sin, already the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, that's sanctification, from all unrighteousness, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So my heart is twofold. My heart in this place is for those who don't know Christ. Receive him today. Just receive him. He is life. He is truth. And he is the only way to life eternal. That's who God is in the name of Christ. And if you don't have them, that's death. Because the Bible says that the wages of the sin in your life is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So I feel like I'm pleading more than normal. And I guess that's okay. If you don't know Christ, come to know him. He receives you with a spirit and he calls you with a spirit that is so precious and so beautiful and so loving So if you don't know him, call him. What does it look like to call God? No, oh, wait, we don't have that. No, we don't have that anymore. No, it's in your spirit. It's in your heart. And you're telling God in your spirit, I know that I am a sinner. I know that if I, if I were to die today, I would be apart from you. And I would, I would live in eternity in destruction, in pain, in torture as opposed to a life abundant with you. I know that. I give up that life, 
and I accept this life. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. That's, that's what it is. If I could do it like God does it, there would be such a sweet aroma to how he comes and woos you to himself. That's what salvation is. The judgment is to just share. It is just to share what happens when we don't have them. The salvation is him wooing you to come because that's what I want for you. That's what I want for all people who will receive me to the full and let me cleanse them, let me transform them, let me make them mine. Is there anybody here that wants to do that? Is there anybody that wants to receive that Jesus, that salvation, that guarantee? I'm telling you, the way I'm asking, I see that hand in the back. Thank you. That was bold. This is bold. This was more like I was. No. Is there anybody else that would like to receive Jesus? This is a big deal. Got you, sir. Is there anybody else? Okay, you're good. I know you're good. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Want to receive Jesus today. His spirit is obviously moving because he's touching your heart. Is there anybody else who'd like to receive him? Wow, how beautiful. Can we all stand and pray together? And then we're going to close in some worship bowl. You're going you're to call the shots as soon as I'm done. All right. Can you all pray together with those that raise their hands to receive Jesus today? to make him Lord of their life. Dear Jesus, thank you for all that you have done for me. So Lord, I I give you thanks and I give you praise. And I ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to change me and help me to become what you have called me to be. Now by your Spirit, Fill me and direct me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If that was the first time you prayed that prayer, tell somebody, tell somebody. Get involved in this church where people will pour the truth of God into your life on a regular basis.